Before we begin, I'd like to say a few words, please. As many of you already know, Nina Library is the Europe Direct Information Centre, EDI for short, for Countess Tipperary, Limerick, Cork and Kerry. Uh, one of eight such centres nationwide and one of 500 plus spread throughout the United States of the European Union. In a nutshell, we stand as points of contact or information between the member citizens of the Member States of the European Union and the European Commission. This talk here tonight is one of a series of events on Nina Edicts Canada 2019. First of all, I start by thanking a few people. My thanks to Brendan Maher here at the source and to his staff, particularly Ursula and Louise, for facilitating this event. Uh, Tipperary County Council are always anxious and pleased to be able to cooperate with other organisations within the community. And so we were delighted to be able to bring this evening talk to the Source Arts Centre here. It's one of the centres here in Thurles. I would also like to thank my colleagues next to all my colleagues next door in the library there, Jerry and Barry, and particularly John and James for all their practical and technical support tonight. This talk was born out of another similar talk that Professor Lucy gave in Nina Library on Brexit last June. Brexit, not as bad as you think, was engaging and informative and very led to a very lively Q&A session afterwards, of which I hope we have something similar here tonight. But if I recall correctly, the bottom line of your talk last year, Brian, was Brexit, disaster, but a disastrous though it is, was happening. There was no going back and there was no do-over. So we should stop wringing our hands and get on with it. And in fact, from this and from our point of view, start to see it and avail of the opportunities that it might afford us, particularly in terms of uh, enticing UK companies and financial centres to see Ireland as a European base. So, that was then, this is now, as we head towards D-Day, perfect towards some of us would say, uh, D-Day on the 29th of March, where are we now? Before, we thought that that's this stage, it would be a very opportune time to bring Brian Lucy back and to bring it to a wider audience here in the United States. Brian Lucy himself needs no inter introduction. He is, as you know, Professor of Finance at uh, Trinity College Dublin uh, School of Business. Uh, he's also a regular columnist with the examiner speaking on matters economic and financial. He has a, uh, an MA in uh, International trade, uh, trade, finance, and economics, and a PhD in finance. Uh, in a former life, he worked in the Department of, uh, in the Department of Health, and he was also a consultant at the Central Bank. So I think he was very well placed to speak to us on this subject here tonight. On that point, uh, before I hand you over to Brian, could I just remind you, if you wouldn't mind turning your phones to silent? This, uh, this talk tonight will be uh, filmed and hopefully we'll be able to upload it uh, in the coming days to YouTube. Um, and with that, I think I will have to make a Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's kind of unusual for a Perryman to be in, uh, in Turles in, uh, in, in, in the month of March. We usually kind of find our way to uh, major national stadia towns later on in the summer, although perhaps not as much recently as one might desire. But uh, we're working on that, we have a plan. Not, not sure it's a great plan. It's better perhaps than a Brexit plan. Uh, it, it's tremendously interesting because tonight, of course, they're voting on, on one of the many meaningless, sorry, meaningful votes that they're talking about. So I'll, I'll be keeping an eye on the, uh, on the phone to see what the story is. So what I want to do is, uh, I feel like an air traffic controller here with this. Well, what I want to do is I want to run through some of the issues around Brexit. I want to maybe, perhaps, declutter some of the, the acronyms, declutter some of the ideas, suggest that there are certainly problems that Ireland is going to face nationally and regionally, but maybe these problems at a national level are perhaps less than you might think. And whatever we might want to then do, in terms of working out how we would share the national cake, that's something that we can do. You know, we can decide to vote for a party or not. We can decide to, you know, get our uh, urban-rural divide or our rich-poor divide. They, they're things we can control, at least in principle. We can't really control Brexit. You know, it's something that's happening. It's an independent decision by the UK as a sovereign country, and you know, as 
uh, as that goes, there's nothing we can do other than, you know, stand by and give advice uh, as, as, as a friendly neighbour. So, let's think a little bit about it. So, what, what exactly is Brexit? I mean, it's one of these horrible portmanteau words that we've all become used to. Uh, British exit from the European Union. This in itself is quite interesting because it's not a UK exit, which doesn't sound as nice, but it suggests that this is driven by at the very least, the island of Great Britain, if not in fact by those who itself identify as being British, aka English. And at one level, this is really a resurgence of English nationalism. You know, the Scottish nationalists, there's Northern Irish nationalists, there's small U Northern Irish unionists, there's Welsh nationalists. It's surprising in some ways that we haven't seen until now a resurgence of English nationalism. But we're seeing that now in spades. And, and this is what they expected, you know, they're going to get unicorns and fairy tales and there was going to be people gambling through fields of wheat, that's an early version of Theresa May, and it was all going to be great, and sunny uplands, and it was all going to be wonderful, you know, it was going to be the easiest deal ever. They were going to get not only the easiest deal ever, but they were going to get a better deal outside the European Union than they would inside the European Union, which was something quite interesting if, if that was to be the case. You know, and, and it was buoyed up by a sense of English exceptionalism, that because they were the nation of Francis Drake and Queen Elizabeth and Oliver Cromwell and Isabel Kingdom Brunel and, and all these wonderful people, that they could pretty much dictate what they wanted to do. The, there was an empire upon which the sun would never set, perhaps because they couldn't trust the English in the dark. But anyway, the reality is something different. The, the reality is that um, Brexit is much more akin to this kind of situation, people teetering on a cliff edge and kind of cutting themselves off. Uh, everybody else is trundling off and it's not going to be an easy path, but they're cutting themselves off on the edge of a, of, of a cliff and hoping that everything will be okay. The, um, you know, the, this is perhaps the best cartoon I've ever seen. You know, they've, they've sawed off their hand, the hand of friendship that's been outstanding to them for 40 years, and are running off, now, oblivious to the fact that their stump is bleeding and they're losing blood and they're, you know, generally not going to be happy. I, I don't know if anybody here is a Terry Pratchett fan, but Terry Pratchett described the word a cheesing. And a cheesing is, as he described it, like a creaming, except it's, it lasts for longer and it's harder. So, the UK is undergoing a self-imposed cheesing through Brexit. There's going to be a lot of graphs on this. And these are the estimates of the effect, the hit to national income uh, compared to a benchmark. All of the figures I'll be talking about tonight are going to be compared to if nothing happened. So they're going to be losing between 7 and 5% and, and of their national income. Now there's one crew called Economists for Brexit. Literally nobody, even themselves, believes their figures. Um, it's, it's a complete outlier. The reality is that there's a group of experts who are all coalescing around a similar kind of approach, you know, 3 to 5 percent, 7 percent maybe. That's probably the case. So the UK is going to lose a chunk of money. I mean, this is a big country. It's a really big country. 1.2 trillion euros uh, a year GDP. Lose 7 percent of that on an ongoing basis. And, phew, that's going to hurt. And this is entirely self-imposed. We mustn't forget, and we mustn't, in a sense, when I say forgive, I mean we mustn't let people off the hook. Nobody is making the UK do this but themselves. They voted in a referendum. They voted narrowly, but they voted to do this. Irregardless of the effects that they were told, in complete denial of the effect they would have on their other European partners, not least the only country with which it shares a land border, that, that would be us, and perhaps at a stretch, Gibraltar, completely ignoring the realities of an interlinked global economy, they chose to do this. Fine. As Abraham Lincoln said, the people have the right to turn their back upon the fire, to turn their backside upon the fire, but then they should have to learn to sit upon the blisters. That's the problem. It's really easy to win elections by selling lies and palatable half-truths to people. Hell, you know, we know that in this country. You know, nobody ever wins an election by going, your life is going to be more miserable 
and I'm going to make you work hard. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go vote for her. But the reality is the reality. So, when you look at the at, you know, Northern Ireland would be literally off the scale. The curious thing is that the areas that voted most heavily for Brexit are the ones that are also going to be amongst the most heavily impacted. Just this evening, Nissan have announced that they're to cease production of the Infinity range of cars in Wearside, in their, in, in, in their, in their Wearside plant. And this is the slow death of the British car manufacturing industry, which is not huge anymore, but it's totemic because you know, it was one of the world's leading car manufacturers for years, and this is bleeding out in front of them. So, day after day, you see a constant drip feed of companies announcing they're leaving, of companies announcing they're ceasing investment, of a reduction of consumer confidence. They've done this to themselves. And the areas that are going to be most hit are, apart from Northern Ireland and Scotland, the ones that vote most heavily for it. So it's a strange thing. We might want to then ask ourselves, you know, if this is so, so bad, you know, what did, they, um, what, what, what did they do? This is how most people, I think, would, would see Brexit. I hope this comes through. No. It's not coming through. I don't think we can see that. Can you hear that? The sound worked earlier on today. Expectations be upended. Our nation's destiny changed. Some people are now saying that was wrong. We could try to muddle through. Somebody got a lot of time in their hands. Take back control of our borders. 
except for the one that actually is a border because we don't want to take control of that. You know, 74% of Leave voters said this is the main reason they voted for it. Take back control of all of our borders, above offer excludes terms and conditions and cutting out. Many people here will remember, I certainly do, being stuck in tailbacks on both sides of the border, north and south. And, uh, you know, that's, that's not that long ago, it's 20, 25 years ago. They were lied to, there's going to be 72 million Turks going to come into the European Union. Well, no. Turkey has been trying to get into the European Union since Adam's dog was a pup, and it's never going to happen. Its political structures are incompatible with the European Union, the more so now since they have a soft coup with Erdogan. And there's no possible way that that's ever going to happen. So that was a lie, and known to be a lie. Uh, this is the kind of phraseology, the, the cost of EU immigration to Britain's welfare system. Of course, the sad reality is that if you look for both the UK and Ireland, new Europeans, as let's call them, or new Irish, new British people from Poland and Latvia and Romania, tend, in fact, to have higher qualifications, earn more, and cost the state less than us. So rather than being a net drain on the UK welfare system, they're a net contributor. But it's this idea that they're huge opening citizens of nowhere that Theresa May has been putting forward that resonates with with, with a large number of people. <clears throat> number of refugees coming to Britain to claim asylum, you know, let's be blunt, you know, brown Muslims coming to our shores, despite the fact that, you know, they were coming to Germany and Austria and going, yeah, well, this is fine. Germany's 80 million people, they took in 1 million refugees, and three years after that, 80% of them would describe themselves as fully assimilated into Germany. Okay? So, a bunch of lies, a bunch of half-truths, very few people thinking about what was going on. So what happens now? What happens now? Where is the UK going to go? Where, where's, it, where's it going to take us? Well, this has been going around for quite some time. What are the options it has? It could go for the kind of European uh, economic area, Norway and Iceland, which are in effect in the European Union, except that they don't get, they get to pay in, they get to accept all of the rules, and they're politely listened to, but they don't have a vote of the council. The Norwegian finance minister doesn't have a say in European economic policy. The Icelandic justice minister doesn't have a say about European security policy. They're, they're listened to politely, and their views are taken on board, they haven't got a vote. Or we could be like Switzerland, which has even less, or they could be perhaps like Turkey, have a, a free trade agreement. But the reality is, today, we're here, and no deal, out into what's called the World Trade Organization, which is the basic architecture of world trade in the absence of anything else. Now, there's a reason that large numbers of countries are busy trying to get themselves into trade agreements. You've got NAFTA, North American Free Trade Association, you've got the Trans-Pacific Partnership, You've got the EU-Japan free trade agreement. Countries like to have arrangements so that they can trade on favourable terms with each other. And the UK is throwing that out the window. The landscape is complex. The European Union is not a homogenous group. There's lots and lots of bits and pieces and semi-detached areas. And you know, we think of the Euro, we think of the European Union, but countries like Montenegro use the European Union, they use the Euro. You know, the, Turkey is in effect in the European Customs Union, but not in the European Union. You've got countries uh, like Belarus, Kazakhstan and Russia, which share some relationships through the Council of Europe. Of course, you've got the inner core, the Euro area, and you've got Schengen. So there's a whole pile, of, whole pile of bits and pieces which all kind of more or less move along happily. And, and the UK is proposing to scrap in its entirety, all of those, and to really be you know, out there or, or there or somewhere, in an entirely unknown territory. This is not, of course, impossible, but the idea that it can be done seamlessly or without cost is, I would argue, somewhat doubtful. We hear a lot of acronyms, customs unions, free trade arrangements, and European economic area. 
And if we think of a kind of a set of Venn diagrams, you've got three core pillars to the European Union as we know it now. The freedom of movement of people to work. This is often forgotten. It's not freedom of movement. You can't just simply schlep up and decide you want to live in rural, rural Poland. You can, but the Poles will ask, well, can you support yourself? Ireland and the UK are less stringent about asking people, can you support yourself? Do you have a job? Can you support yourself with savings? There's going to be restrictions, perhaps, on the amount of social welfare you can earn, etc. These are all entirely within the remit of any country to put in place. It's freedom of movement to work. It's not freedom of movement to go and draw the dough. So if the UK or Ireland have a problem with people allegedly coming, and the woo they come when you get off the boat and you get 14 free houses the following day, well, A, that's a lie, and B, if it was true, it's entirely our fault. The free movement of capital, in other words, that you can trade financial services and money can flow from any country to any country, and the free movement of goods. And these all require certain things to happen. They all require certain things, such as the freedom of establishment and the recognition of, 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 of licenses, so that you know, a Hungarian dentist can, with very limited uh, regulatory burden, come and set up in, in Thurlis if she wishes. That an Irish architect can go and he can start working in Milan with, with very little in the way of a problem, because it's recognised that the qualifications are, are, are the same, or at least they're of a similar level. And again, in pulling out of Europe, in the way in which the UK is pulling out, all of this will go. UK architects will no longer be able to work anywhere without proving, basically, that they can do the job. It's not because the European Union wants to be mean, it's simply because the UK has decided to put itself into a different path. Its position is very similar to this. We all remember blazing saddles. And the sheriff had a wonderful trick, you know, basically, you know, give me what I want or I'm going to shoot myself. And that's pretty much what the UK is threatening to do. That unless the European Union breaks its own red lines, unless the European Union, in effect, acts illegally, because remember, the European Union is not a club. It's not like, you know, going down to the swimming pool or playing a hand of 45. It's a set of legal, binding international treaties. And we know more than anybody else, because we have to vote on the plastic things every time they come up. And we've been known to say, hold on, we don't like this. And then the government goes off and tries to get another negotiated settlement. So for example, Nice, we voted no, for a variety of reasons. The government went off, it got a whole set of arrangements, which were put into a legally binding text. And if anybody's interested in what those were, they are an appendix to the Treaty of Accession of Croatia, which is a legally binding text. Oh yes, also, Croatia joins the European Union, P.S. Ireland, following things don't apply. Fine, we voted again. It's a legally binding arrangement, it's not a club. And you cannot overturn legally binding arrangements on a whim. Young Paul Junk, uh, Michel Barnier, Jean Paul Juncker cannot simply go, I look, sure, three said, you know, we like you, you know, it doesn't matter, ignore that. It doesn't work like that. Countries don't work like that. International law doesn't work like that. So, what are the options? I'm, going to, I'm sure these slides will be made available afterwards if people really want them. But this is effectively a, a kind of a, an expanded version of the slide beforehand. The UK is really, right now it's got all of these things. But what it doesn't have is the ability to negotiate its own trade deals with the rest of the world. Very interestingly, one of the big things that people in the UK are saying about Brexit is, well, you know, we can go back to the way it was in 1972 and we can work with the Commonwealth. And yet, um, Rudd, the ex-Australian um, Prime Minister, had a scathing article yesterday in the, in the UK papers going, this is deluded. This is 46 years ago. Things have moved on. We're not there anymore to supply you with cheap beef. We're busy trading with the rest of the world. You know, cop yourself on. But it's this sense of having lost control, 
this sense of willing, wanting to take back control, this sense of being desirous of having its ability to negotiate its own trade deals, which is dubious because smaller countries don't get good deals. The UK is just one country. This is sometimes what's called Brino, or Brexit in name only. And in effect, we are now at a point of inflection between these two situations. And as is highly likely, I'll just check, if they vote down their... Um, is it gone, is it? Yeah, so they voted down May's agreement today. Now that means that tomorrow they have to vote on whether or not they take no deal, a crash out off the table. One assumes they would do that. But if they don't, then by automatic action of UK law, they crash out on the 29th of, May, of, of March into this World Trade Organization where everything becomes really, really difficult for everybody. And that's the apocalyptic scenario that, in a sense, I think we should look at. Because if you prepare for the worst and hope for the best, then you shouldn't be too badly put off. It, one of the more maddening things dealing with people involved in this is, it's not just in the UK, this idea that in some way Ireland is so intimately attached to the UK economically that we are just a mere periphery, a, a dingleberry to, to the UK, that we have no independent economic existence beyond the UK. Well, let's have a little think about that. Ireland's UK share of Ireland's trade in goods and services. Right now, 2016, 2017 figures are down around here. We exported last year, 11% of our exports went to the UK. 11%. We import a bit more, we're a bit more dependent on the UK for imports, but 18%. So 9 in 10 euros of every euro, of every 10 euros that go out of Ireland as an export, go to somewhere other than the UK. Now, you know, this is very different. The 1970s. But look, 1972, joined the European Union. 1992 is when this really begins to fall off a cliff. Why? Because that's the introduction of the single market. The ability of Irish companies to seamlessly export whatever they could and to import from wherever they wish, anywhere in the European Union, without any barrier. In fact, you could turn the argument on and say that they need us more than we need them because we're one of the very few countries with whom the UK has a positive trade balance. Countries are not households, but countries do have to, at a macroeconomic level, balance their books. If you import more than you export, you have to make up that loss in some way. The UK does it very simply. The UK imports an awful lot more goods than it exports but it exports an awful lot more services than it imports because, particularly in London, you've got these century-old companies and, and pools of expertise on some of the most arcane aspects of, of law. You've got some of the world's leading um, accounting companies. You've got incredibly good companies around PR and communications. It's a, it's a services powerhouse. But we're one of the few countries where they actually have a positive relationship. And if you look at it, we actually have, we, we, we sell quite a lot of pharmaceuticals, we sell a lot of agri food, I've got to come back to this, particularly given the, where I am. We import a lot of stuff, but we export quite a bit to the UK as well. But remember, all those are dwarfed by an order of magnitude of the stuff we export elsewhere. I'm not going to go through, through this. You can look at the slides if you want to. It just shows where the, um, you know, where the balance has come from. This masks some sectoral weaknesses. And if you look at exports and imports, exports being in blue, imports being in, 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 in brown, we see that in agri food, about half of the uh, imports of agri food come from the UK. Only about 20% of, of our exports, even of agri food, go to the UK. 
Now obviously in some product lines that's much more, but in some product lines it's much less. Wholesale retail is more balanced, pharmaceuticals, etc. In other words, there are large chunks of the Irish economy which, while the UK is of course being a large and close neighbour with whom we share many, many cultural similarities, of course it's going to be our big market. It's not our biggest market, it's not our only market. I wonder if the 29th of March should become perhaps, given all of that, a national holiday in the UK and it could be National Wrong Way Corrigan Day. Does anybody here know who Wrong Way Corrigan was? Anybody? Well, Wrong Way Corrigan was a man who set out, as he said, to fly from New York to Los Angeles and ended up flying from New York to Clifton. Uh, and he became known as Wrong Way Corrigan. And he was one of the, at the time, he was one of the fastest people to fly solo across the, uh, uh, across the Atlantic. But I wonder if we should, if the UK should institute National Wrong Way Corrigan Day because they're going about it the wrong way. They're talking about a free trade agreement 